Welcome everybody to the Christian Marauder. Did you know that the seven days of creation in Genesis provide the ABCs of how to understand the language of Bible numbers? In Genesis chapters 1 through 3, it's like God trying to teach beginners in kindergarten the ABCs of biblical number definitions, along with lessons how to correctly identify and interpret these. As I pointed out in parts 1 and 2, each letter of the Hebrew alphabet comes from an ancient pictograph form. Each letter in sequence represents a number, and each number has a meaning. For example, the first letter is Aleph, which represents a number one, and the second letter is Bet, which is the second letter, and Gimel, which is the third letter, which is the number three. goes on like that, and so forth. So with this, folks, let's learn our ABCs from the Hebrew alphabet song. Well, folks, did you like that little tune, the Hebrew alphabet song? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Anyway, Genesis chapter 1 helps define the meanings of the first seven Hebrew numeric numbers. In fact, the number meanings are found in the description of each of the days of creation, all in accordance with context and grammar. And thus, we learn how to interpret the numbers in the Bible and find their themes, which defines their numbers. After that, uh, we're going to look at some key genealogical events like the births of very important people and events that happened throughout the entire book of Genesis that also line up with numbers 8 through 20. Other books of the Torah share the same pattern but it gets more complex. You first you learn your ABCs, simple words, and more complex lessons as one moves out of kindergarten into first and second and third grades and so forth etc. After this I'm going to give you a crash course on how this works from John chapter 4 and the parable of the sower and found in Luke's gospel on a higher grade level so you can see what I mean by grade levels. I will then conclude this video by addressing something that many people are asking me concerning issues of people seeing triple numbers and quadruple numbers like 111. 222, 333, 111, 1212, and these people report that they're driven by these to find some important personal message in these. I would, again, like I said before, let me assure you, neither God nor his heaven sent angels are trying to contact you in this manner at all. Something more sinister is, and I'm going to show you how to break the influence of being driven to find the meanings of these numbers, okay? at the end of this video. So with that, turn to Genesis chapter 1. And I will be going quite quickly through these really quick here. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, concerns the first day of creation. It says it at the in verse 5. This was the first day of creation. Thus we have a number, the number 1. It's that simple, right? And what's written above it helps pinpoint the meaning, a theme. So let's look at this and find out what it means. The number 1 is a pictograph of a head of an ox. Its root meaning is the strongest leader, or any type of strong leader. It could be God, man, an angel, so forth, etc. The context here is plain. It is God himself as the only true strong one. So it, does, it makes perfect sense in the first day of creation that these, this Hebrew letter would pinpoint in this context God himself being as the author of creation, the only one strong enough to do this, the only true one in existence, self-existent before time began, God Almighty, that's who he is. So the context defines this as God as the only strong one, omnipotent reigns, who creates all out of nothing and created all this by his word that divides light from darkness. Okay, so we get a message that his word divides light from darkness from the very beginning. Jesus came as the light of the world. And what did he do? He who believes on Jesus will be saved, and he who doesn't lives in darkness, right? 
the word divides light from darkness from the very beginning so the whole intent and purpose of God is finding out something very important which we will get into as we go through this series so let's continue with this the second meaning of Aleph number one is about being yoked or united to a strong leader and his authority just as the 24 elders in Revelations 4 10 and 4 11 said from the King James you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I mean, I tell you, those words are powerful because it describes how God omnipotently created all things for its purpose and pleasure. What was that again? Give you a hint. Dividing light from darkness. Some of you who know your Bible already caught on. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Stay tuned for more here. Now we go to the second day of creation. That corresponds to the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet, which is a pictograph of a house or a tent. And its basic root meaning is a household. And its number meaning is division. Division to see who's in a household and, and not. So you have God who in himself is going to divide light from darkness to see who is in his household and, and who's not. But before he does that, he has a plan. And second day of creation reveals that plan and what it's about. So just look and see if you see these definitions in the, in the text itself as you read it yourself. We see in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 8, God dividing the firmament from the waters and thus made heaven his house. That's what it says. He made heaven. He divided the firmament and the waters and he made a firmament called heaven. Okay, do you, do you get the picture? Thus the waters, as scholars point out, can refer to space itself or literal water or even the abus or the abyss, which would make sense in light of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, 41. Hell was created for the devil and his angels and his minion. Well, you have, what we see here in Genesis chapter 2, we have God preparing a place to dwell and setting the terms. Who will be in his house, hold of heaven, are in chaos. I want to leave that. As food for thought. Genesis chapter 1 verses 9 through 13 concerns the third day of creation where God moves the waters of earth to their place and dry land to its place and unites to the dry land grass and plants. Now notice the letter Gimel is a picture of a leg whose basic root meaning expresses travel movement as in moving something around. Traveling toward unity of some type. Okay so you have all this happening. You have the the water is being divided from the land and you have what's being united to the waters is being united to the waters and what is being united to the land on earth is the plants. So you have movement, motion, and, and uniting all expressed in the meaning of the number three as a theme, as a root theme of this. Do you get the picture now? Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 through 20 is the fourth day of creation. And the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, remember from that song, is Dalet. Is that of a door, pathway, or entryway? On day four, we see God's creative works, creating the sun, the moon, the stars, and setting them on their pathways for seasons, days, and years. Thus, God entered by his works linear time to guide the seasons in his created world, just as the meaning of the number four indicates. A doorway, a pathway, an entryway of creative works. That begins something new. So God created something new here. Time. Linear time for seasons and stuff. And he, he also placed the, the sun, the moon, and the stars in the right place. And set their path in order. So you have the meaning of the number four clearly portrayed in the fourth day of creation. On the fifth day of creation, we discover something startling happened. <laughs> Recall that the root meaning of the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is He, and it is the number five, and it means behold. It means a revelation of some type, something startling. Behold, something is, is happening here, something to pay attention to of some type. And here we see a revelation of life on earth beginning through the creation of flesh and blood animals, okay, beginning at that time. Next is the letter Va, which is the sixth day of creation. And on the sixth day of creation, we have more animals created. And we also have humanity created. And Va is defined simply as the number for man, which it is. But Va is a picture 
graph of a tent peg or a nail with the root meaning indicating what one attaches or secures or hooks self oneself to. So what we, what we see in the sixth day of creation is God making mankind and attaching to man his image and likeness, get the picture, in verse 26, in order for him to govern the world by reflecting God's character traits. What do I mean by that? It means reflect the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, uh, righteousness, holiness, so forth, etc., to reflect truth and, and, and all that stuff and govern the world and govern the world around you according to the fruit of the spirit through the fruit of God's character traits and walking with him in the cool of the day in that reflection okay um, doesn't mean that you are another God at all or in a God class nor does it mean that you're a little God that's heresy what it means is to bear the image of God is to reflect his character traits to be transformed into the image of Christ like Romans chapter 8 uh, verse 26 and 27 talk about as being uh, able to bear the fruit of the Spirit and govern our world that, that we, we live in, our families, our homes and stuff, according to the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, hope. Okay, do you get the picture? Righteousness, holiness, understanding, wisdom, and truth, all the fruits of the Spirit. That's how what we are to reflect. We were designed for that, but we fell away. I'll get, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we are to be God's representative in his heavenly council on earth and represent that. That's what we were designed to do, okay? So God attached his image to us to be able to reflect governing by the fruit of the Spirit. And thus God also attaches the animals of the earth to man to govern as his representative. Just as the day six strongly suggests and lines up with the meaning of the number six. So at the end of day 6 in verse 31, we see God examining everything he made. And it was all very, very good. And, and the Hebrew word good here means functioning as in well-pleasing, fruitful, morally correct, proper, all in accordance to design and God's order. So he's just checking things out. Next comes the seventh day of creation that's found in Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 and 3, where God rests and sanctifies the seventh day as the Sabbath day. This fits the meaning of the number seven. How? Let's look and explore how. The seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Zayin. It's a pictograph of a plow, which can also be turned into a sword as well. I'll talk more about that later. The context pinpoints the meaning, and here it refers to plowing, as in work, planting, because God literally created out of nothing and then plowed and planted and made the entire universe and this world and all that's in it and set its course, its design, its patterns, saw the plants grow up, saw human beings doing their thing, everything was functioning, right? Just think about it. So what was God doing? He was going to rest and his perfection that he made. For example, a farmer will plow and he will plant. Then he rests and he watches how things grow. And while the crops grow, he tends and takes care of the crops as needed. That is the idea of how God, who never slumbers or sleeps, rests. He tends to his creation. Okay, do you get the picture? Tell it's the time of the final harvest. Do you get the picture now? When everything is ready for the Hebrew idea of perfection, which means wholeness, soundness, maturity, balanced, a, a perfect state of balance, uh, a, a, in a perfect state of completion. That's what God was resting in. He, now he's going to be tending and taking care of things until the harvest day comes. A lot of meaning that comes from the seventh day of creation when God rests. More than what we think, isn't it? Then notice, there is a major event a new player comes in a new genealogical character comes in and that event is found in chapter 3 of Genesis called the fall of humanity Chet is the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and its pictograph is of a fence or a petition in a house it means a separation and its root definition to separate or and so that people can be brought into a new place it can refer to a new birth or new beginnings that's what the word eight mean 
So here in Genesis chapter 3, we discover a wall of separation between God and mankind began. A new beginning for mankind began of labor and pain, and sin entered the world, just as Paul writes in Romans chapter 5. Along with God declaring his remedy for this, through the sacrifice that he set forth through, by covering Adam and Eve's nakedness with the animal skins. So that God can bring forth a new day when someone will come and crush the serpent's head from the seed of man by paying the price for our sins in our place, all symbolized in that chapter near the end of Genesis chapter 3. So we see the fully, completely, the entire definition of the number 8 of the pictograph of a fence wall, a barrier, an entry into a new day being expressed in Genesis chapter 3. How cool is that? So let's look at the ninth big event in Genesis, the birth of Cain and Abel. The ninth Hebrew letter is Tet. It's a picture of a basket divided in four compartments. And other people have noted it is, represents a gift basket divided into four sections. The idea of these gifts is to produce or teach justice or judgment that one gives to another as a gift. Think of the gifts of the, the nine gifts of the Spirit. There's nine gifts of the Spirit, remember? And they're to produce justice and mercy and grace upon the earth. That's what they're for there. The gifts of the Spirit are not play toys or play things. They're to produce uh, justice to a person. If a person is oppressed or some way, the wisdom and knowledge and discerning of spirits can all bring justice to them. So the gift basket with its four compartments show that such gifts can come from God, they can come from man, a snake, or the flesh, or the world, okay? So you have four compartments. One can come from God, one can come from man, one can come from the fallen serpent, all those fallen angels, or the world, or your flesh, to spread its own idea of justice and judgment of the giver. So if you want the justice and, uh, uh, and judgment of the snake, you're going to have riots in the street, people burning down things and, and hate and justifying of thefts, uh, stealing from people to give to the have-nots. You know, you have, you, you have theft, killing, robbing, and destroying as a gift given. Do you get the idea? The flesh will give you pleasure, but you kill your body with alcohol. Destroy your system, okay? That's the idea of, the, uh, of, the, of that. So the person who's drinking a lot of alcohol, or doing drugs, they're giving themselves a fleshly, worldly fixed to feel better that's their sense of justice but it's killing them it's harmful but god has a different types of gifts so this represents a gift basket okay so here we got to look at giving the idea is giving and it's found in the story of cain and abel and ends at the time of seth so we see cain and abel offer their gifts to god right cain gave abel his judgment gift of death because he was jealous okay and proud later we see cain gave the ancient world his progeny as a gift who brought a lot of hardship into it according to the ancient writings and jewish traditions by their actions and deeds now the tenth major event is found in in genesis chapter 4 verses 25 and 26 with the birth of seth where we find in verse 26 where through his line people began to call on the name of the lord that's what the last thing it says in chapter 4 is that people began to call on the name of the Lord through Seth's line. Yod is the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and thus the number 10. It is a pictograph of an arm and its number denotes the works of the arm or hands as in helping out. That's the kind of the root definition. By calling on the name of the Lord, they call for the arm of the Lord to help. Isaiah 53 describes Jesus as the arm of the Lord that was revealed through the sin sacrifice that he gave to the world. Okay? He gave himself to the world. That's just food for thought. Next, 10 means also living responsibly and loyally to God and man by obeying the Lord and his authority. Are living in accordance with God's established divine order are according to his commandments. The Ten Commandments are ten responsibilities how to live right before God and man. That's the idea behind the number ten. The strong arm of the Lord will help you live right before God and man. And it's done through faith in God's grace to give you an arm 
to guide and lead you and help you. That is the idea. The ancient Hebrew people missed it by a hundred miles. Okay, <laughs> don't you miss it? And also the name Seth means God appointed another seed, as it says in the New King James. Recall that Jesus Christ in the book of Luke in the genealogy there comes from Seth's lineage, who crushed the serpent's head as Genesis chapter 3 talks about. And he also fulfilled commandments for us who believe. Thus he was the arm of the Lord who helped us. So those who call upon the Lord can be saved. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? I bet you didn't know that was all there in, the, in that chapter. Was those few verses about people calling on the name of the Lord. How the number 10 opens up its meaning. So you understand that this was a time when people were starting to call on the Lord. And you also have Cain's lineage there who was following another path. Remember, God created and he spoke and divided darkness from light. So God's up to something. He wants to see who's going to dwell in his house in heaven. So he's going to move things in place to make that happen. That's number three on the days of creation. Number four, he has a creative pathways. You're going to set in order seasons and times and stuff for things to work. Okay. Fifth, it's going to be a great revelation and, and something startling going to happen. And what's that? It's number six. A man comes into the world as prophesied to crush the serpent's head. But he is no mere mortal man. He is God incarnate in human flesh. He came as 100% God and 100% man. I'm telling you, Jesus never left his divinity. He kept his divinity. He just stepped into the role of a servant as a human being. But he's still 100% God. He never left. His divinity. Yeah, great is that mystery. I'll explain that much later as we go along. But right now, I don't want to get lost there. But, you know, just keep, keep tracking with me. Why did all this happen? Number seven, for us to find rest. So we can rest in the work of Christ who saves us, who will get us through. So we become citizens of heaven and no longer of the devil in this earth. Amen and amen. So number eight, so we are separated from the world. A gospel message that doesn't teach separation from the world, is, in my personal opinion, is not the true gospel. Let's look at the 11th major event that's found in Genesis chapter 6. It's called the Days of Noah. Very important here. And number 11 means this, the mystery of darkness that covers the world and makes it live irresponsible and in a state of chaos. It brings chaos to God's order and wants to crush and destroy it. It's a mystery. It's the occult workings is what it is. The mysteries of darkness. The occult workings. And guess what? We see that in the text. In Genesis chapter 6 concerning the fallen watchers in the Nephilim that taught humanity the dark arts like the ancient writings the first Enoch plainly reveals these watchers taught sorcery. Do you, Again, do you see how these major events begin to line up with the definitions of the uh, <laughs> the meaning of the numbers to produce what we call a theme in the Bible. So you'll get the correct definitions. You cannot interpret Bible numbers outside of the Bible. I want to make that plainly simple. You cannot see numbers like 222, 333, three, think there's some secret definition. Are you seeing two or three? God's trying to speak to you something. That is the world of the occult. That's the dark arts. Stay away from it. I'm trying to help you. You only can interpret the meanings of the word of god by the word of god okay so you the only way you can it's it's by the bible it's like here you got to find the numbers in the bible the context grammar hebrew grammar even in, you have to think hebrew in the new testament you can't think greek forget that won't work everything relies on the hebrew grammar the hebrew text and the themes that are found in here to interpret the numbers correctly and they only can be used in this book and it, and it reveals something almost like God's commentary. He's revealing something, layers of depths of meaning in the text that does not subtract from this book nor adds to it. It just gives you insight. No different than, um, let's see, uh, 
uh, um, R.A. Torrey or, or Dwight L. Moody giving their own commentary on a chapter or R.A. Rye commentary or any other commentary out there, Gusick's commentary on the Bible or Utley's Bible commentary. No different than that. Someone looking through the scriptures, but here well, through the biblical numbers, was you get what I call God's commentary, and the numbers just bring out the commentary definition. You cannot find secret messages in this. You will not find winning the Powerball numbers in it. You will not find your destiny in it. All that's the occult. That is the mystery of darkness. Okay? And I guarantee you, if you try, uh, you'll get in under the hook and attach yourself to fallen watchers masquerading as angels of light. Boy, I want to get off that rabbit trail right now. Let's get back to, to the twelfth major event. I'm just going through a few of these. The twelfth major event is found after the flood where God spoke to Noah and his sons in Genesis 8, 20 through Genesis 9 through verse 14. Why do I say that? Well, twelve in biblical numbers means harmony, the harmony of governing order or, and the setting up of representative leadership. That's everybody's in harmony with something or someone. So here we see in these verses where God reestablishes man's representative leadership on earth, albeit in his fallen state. Read uh, Genesis chapter 8, starting in verse 20, all the way through Genesis chapter 9 through Genesis 14. And you'll see God reestablishing <laughs> representative leadership. And next is the number 13. And number 13 means apostasy, depravity, rebellion, outworking of hubris, where one becomes enemies of God, or enemies of each other, or so forth, etc. So the 13th major event comes when? At the time of Nimrod in the Tower of Babel, where humanity disobeyed God's command to go forth into all the world, but rather apostatized, fell away, and stayed together on the plains of Shinar, where they fell away from God. Guess what? And with hubris, built the Tower of Babel. Thus they rebelled, fell away, and apostatized. I got to tell you, all this does not appear to be some cosmic accident or something I'm pulling out of the air. Uh, it looks to me like God wants to teach us the ABCs on how to recognize his fingerprints in the numeric language of numbers that are found in the Bible, which identifies the author of this amazing book as God himself. Who inspired it okay I'm not making this up when you under unlock the meaning of numbers and you explore God's commentary in it you you just sit back and utter amazement and go wow wow God this this is amazing but God is real Jesus is real the whole thing is real wow <laughs> and you fall on your face in the state of holiness and, and a wonderment of the Lord folks I tell you it is the truth that's what happens so with that folks I want to jump ahead and show you how the subject algorithm and a more advanced level of learning, say fifth or sixth grade, maybe even third to fifth, sixth grade level reading, is found in John chapter four. So you understand how the subject algorithm works. And by using the same numbers according to the context and the themes that we established in Genesis, you'll see how this all works. So we're gonna look at this algorithm that's found in John chapter four with the woman at the well, and we're also going to look at the parable of the sower. So let's look at this. So we have Jesus, who is this only strong one, the Word who created all the worlds in the universe. You have Jesus, the strong one, coming to a well, keep everything in order. Jesus came to the well, and the woman came to the well. So you have to keep everything in order. So you have Jesus, the only strong one, came to a well. You have Jesus, a subject. You have a well, another noun, and you have the woman. You have three nouns there. Think of nouns. You have Jesus, the strong one, came to the well. Okay, so you have the strong one, Jesus, and he came to a well. Why? Number two answers that. He wants to uh, see who will be in his house and who's not. The whole purpose of, of the Lord is to divide light from darkness. In the very beginning of Genesis, it says that. He wants to build a household, and he wants to see who is going to be coming into it willingly and who will not come into it willingly. Those who come into it willing by simple belief enter in his house, and those who will not will find themselves with the devil and his minions in the lake of fire for all eternity. Okay, which house do you want to belong to? So he comes to the well, the place of waters, 
You can either have living water that the Lord gives of the Holy Spirit that wells up the eternal life, or you can have the well of the world, okay? So get the picture here, what's going on. So you have Jesus, the strong one, coming to the well to see who will be in his house and who will not. That's the idea. Then you have the third one is the woman. And so from the numbers, we see that the, Jesus, the only true strong one, came to the well to draw out those he invites into his household from those who, who are not. I mean, they, it's all willingly here. And that's the meaning of the number two. To do so, the father drew the woman to him, moved her to travel and come to the well at the particular time Jesus was there. And three means to move toward unity. And in this case, move to unite to the household of God through Jesus Christ, the living word of God at the well of living water. The woman was an outcast because she had to draw water at the hottest time of the day away from the other woman. So that's already been established in many Bible commentaries. You don't need me to reiterate that. And the reason that she was an outcast had to be dealt with and Jesus does just that because people have been cast away from the presence of God, right? And we, and the Lord knows how to deal justly through the gifts of the Holy Spirit to bring justice to the woman who's an outcast. He wants to bring that to you too. We find Jesus asking next about her husband, and she answered in truth, and Jesus told her that she had five husbands already, and six is not her husband, remember? So we have the numbers five, and another one added there that equals six, and I'll explain this. Recall, five means the revelation of grace or judgment. So we see that this woman was trying to find grace in one failed relationship after another through five husbands. I want to ask you, that's God's commentary, not mine. How human is that? How many people in this world, do we want to deny that that happens? That people try to find grace and escape judgment or whatever type of judgment through one failed relationship after another? How human is that? The Lord walks down and wants to draw people in these type of situations into his household to find grace. Maybe that's you. Well, Jesus next said, the one you live with now is not your husband's. So the woman was seeking a strong one in order to escape judgment and find grace in the village. This tells me that the guy that she was shacked up with had to be one of the elders of the city. Why do I say that? Because according to the Samaritan law, which mirrors the Jewish law, we find that said in this very passage where they have two temples, two sets of laws. If you're caught in adultery, you're stoned to death. In order to escape being stoned to death for committing adultery like this woman was doing by shacking up with a guy, this guy had to be a head honcho in the city to avoid that. If that was some common Joe Blow, uh, Johnny come lately type of guy, she'd be stoned to death along with the guy. Okay? That's how I know this. Because it lines up with the culture and the time frame and the law. That's how you use Bible numbers. They have to line up with certain things. So she was in one failed relationship seeking a strong one to give her support to escape judgment and find grace. And, it, and guess what? She had to live as an outcast, but she was with a strong elder of the city. Probably the guy who she talked to who came up and first met Jesus. Most likely that's the guy. Can't prove that, but I highly suspect it. I highly suspect that's the case. So... You add five and one together, you get six. And a six is one not her husband. It meant that she was looking for a strong one to attach herself to escape judgment and find grace. She could have been stoned to death, like I said, for adultery. And so this guy was of great authority for this not to happen. And then all of a sudden, like every human being does when they're confronted with something, they're trying to hide. She changes the subject to religion like many do, and discover that Jesus is the true Messiah in the process. So she leaves her water pot, her, her old life. She leaves her water pot, her old life, and tells folks in the town, and they end up coming to Jesus. In other words, she leaves her water pot. That's the seventh, like noun there. <laughs> so she finds rest. She gives up herself, lays it at Jesus' feet, and goes back to the town and brings the entire town to Jesus into the household of God. And guess what happens in the story here? Uh, they People said to Jesus, why don't you stay for us two days? Stay with us for two days. Why would they say two days? Why didn't they say three, four, five? 
Two days is the picture graph of a house. Two days. In other words, what's telling here in God's commentary, he brings the outcasts, those who are broken, those who are battered by life, those who are seeking, seeking some sort of grace amidst all the kinds of judgment to come into his household. So they were invited him to stay two days. Why? Because God set that up saying, hey, you can find grace and mercy through Jesus and come into his household by coming to Jesus and inviting him into your house, into your town. Do you get the picture? How do you like them apples, folks? How do you like those things, man? I just tell you that. I tell you, it is an um, amazing thing. Again, I want to reiterate it. The folks asked Jesus and his disciple to stay two days, indicating what the number two means. It means bring those into his household, and after this he went into his home area, his hometown, where many refused to believe him. This is befitting of the number two concerning division. I mean, dividing who is in the house from those who are not. And God brings the battered and the bruised and leaves the proud outside. The proud will not come into the house of God. But those who are battered and bruised in life will come. Invite them in to their house and they will be saved. Amen. So with that, let's look at the parable of the sower using the subject algorithm again and step up the learning process. We're going to do this in Luke chapter 8 verses 5 through 15 along with Matthew chapter 13 verse 23 which adds some additional numbers. So let's apply the ABCs of number meanings here and see God's commentary on all of this. I'm going to bring this up on the screen so you can read it. It says here, His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant and he said to you has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God but to the rest of it it's given in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand now notice in luke chapter 8 verse 5 the sower is a subject went out to sow his seed and the seed is the next subject so you have the sower meaning the strong one a messenger who's called by god went out to sow his seed in luke chapter 8 verse 11 and jesus is describing the meaning of the parable of the sower that's what we're going to focus in on here now this parable is this the seed is the word of god two that's the second subject. The sower is one, the strong one, messenger, someone called by God, maybe God himself, went out to sow his seed, the word of God. Why is the word of God sown? To bring folks into his household and separate those who willingly will not enter. Isn't that true? Look at verse 12. I'm going to scroll this up a little bit. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Those beside the road are the third subject here, the third subject to look at. And that means those who have heard, and number three means moving toward unity with God or the devil or something else. See, that's the idea of the number three. So those who have heard are moving toward unity with God in this case. Then the devil, number four, means the creative works, you know, okay. It means a pathway entered into, another life being entered into. This makes much more sense now. And the devil's creative works enters, comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Do you understand what's being said here? Those beside the road who have heard are moving toward unity of God, but then the devil's creative works pull you away and open you another pathway so you uh, do not believe the word and are saved. You're pulled away from it through the devil's creative works. Just let your mind roll on the devil's creative works or kill, rob, and destroy and make you enjoy the process. Just think of alcohol drugs think about sex rock and roll think about whatever it is yeah, i think you get the picture of the devil's works folks i really really do okay let's look at verse 13 those on the rocky soil are the fifth subject matter here and it says and number five means behold receive a revelation of god's grace that's the context here receiving the message of god's grace those on the rocky soil that behold and receive the revelation of God's grace are those when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while in a time of temptation. The word temptation means testing and trials. They fall away. The word fall away means drawn away as into revolt. Okay, so those on the rocky soil receive the word with joy of God's grace. They believe for a little while, but in time of testing and trials come up, they draw away and they revolt because their hearts are rocky 
they have not received the word okay do you see because they revolt just letting you understand what it means here verse 14 the seed which fell amongst the thorns remember this the sixth group here is the seed which fell among the thorns is the root meaning is what man attaches himself to these are the ones who have heard and they go on their way and are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity why they attach themselves to the worries and riches and pleasures of this life and the word of god is choked out of their life they love their riches and the worry and the anxiety and the riches and pleasures of life more than the word of god they're not having the separation going on in their heart that's required of the word of god see the word of god does what see who's in the house and who's not so the word is sown to see who's in the house so the lord's showing first who is not in his house remember the sower the strong one the lord god has a messenger comes he sows the word of god that's number two subject which means separation to see divide to see who's in whose house so you have three characters here who are not entering in and, and they explain why they don't enter in so let's continue here the sower sowed the seed the word of god why to sort out those who will reside in god's house from those who refuse Look at verse 15. But the seed in the good soil are those ones, and this is the seventh subject, the, the seed on the good soil. The good soil are the ones, that's number seven, and that picture of a plow, who have heard the word with an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Remember, the idea of a plow is to break the ground, plant the crops or the trees in the vineyard, tend to it until it grows. So you see that principle right in here. Who hears the word with an honest and good heart, holds it fast, and bears fruit with perseverance. The whole idea of number seven, bringing into a state of perfection, completeness, wholeness, and soundness is brought out in that verse. So again, recall that the meaning of seven is about plowing and tending to a crop that is planted. Thus those who have the good heart, the good soil, have been plowed by God's word, and the word of god grows to maturity to complete the person make them whole sound mature level-headed balanced in a state you know, heading toward god's perfection this is what the word of god does in the heart it grows one to maturity not to more wackiness and craziness so folks in matthew chapter 13 verse 23 we find that the book of matthew records some things that are missing that luke did not explain and and it reveals further numeric meanings and insights into the text so let's look at matthew chapter 13 verse 23 and the one whom the seed was sown on the good soil this is the man who hears the word and understands it who indeed bear fruit and brings forth some hundredfold some sixty and some thirty so i look at those and right there i go i i have three sets of numbers so i go back to the hebrew uh alphabet I know what the pictographs are, I know the root meanings, I know the meanings of them. That explains what the fruit they're producing consists of. Okay? How many want to know what the fruit, uh, what God wants us to produce? Right there it tells us in those numbers. So for those that hear and understand are described further by the meaning 100. 100 consists of the Hebrew letter Kaf, a picture denoting either the rising of the sun or the setting of the sun for death. In other words, the rising of the sun to life or the setting of the sun for death. Um, has a definition also indicates what follows or soon to break forth that reveals who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. That's what the kind of the themes that the number 100 is found in here. It's, all, it's found all throughout one's lifetime. It's about lifetime and, and the knowledge gained from life and what you do with it. So those who hear and understand are described further by the meaning of the 100, who bear fruit during their life that reveals that they belong to God. In other words, they are rising and going through life showing that they belong to God by their conduct. Okay? They may not be perfect. If they make a mistake, they repent, they ask forgiveness, and they move on, okay? They, they've learned to walk humbly before God and do what is right before God and man despite their mistakes. In other words, they understand mistakes are made so we can learn from them, okay? Just saying. So what type of fruit is described in the meaning number 60? So let me scroll this up so you can see what it means. Number 60 is the Hebrew letter Shemah. It's a picture of a hand or a staff. That's what a pictograph means. 
It means to support or prop up what one relies and leans on the most. Either some authority structure or you can re the devil, you can rely on God. Okay, it's a it's a it's a picture of a staff and what man leans upon. That's what the idea of it is. It's your hands on a staff, it's what gives you your support. So you prop up, you rely on something. The type of fruit described by the number 60 is the fruit of leaning and relying on who the number 30 reveals. And the number 30 is the Hebrew letter Lamed, which is a picture of a shepherd's staff. Or it's a picture of the good shepherd who guides one heart. Thus 30 relies on the shepherd and his staff who moves, guides, and protects the heart and controls us by leading the sheep, who are sealed by the blood of Jesus, fastening one to the shepherd of their souls. That's the idea of 30. 30 is all about the shepherd's staff used to guide and control and direct you. It's also a picture of a shepherd. It could be the devil could be your shepherd, a man could be your shepherd, God or God to be your shepherd. But in this case, it's referring to the Lord, the good shepherd, who Jesus is called the good shepherd, and letting his staff lead and guide and direct your life and and come, go after you and put that little hook on it when you start to stray away. Aren't you glad that we we serve a good shepherd that when we stray away, he goes after and he brings them back to the fold? I'm glad I serve a living Lord who does that. So let's look at, I'm going to bring this up on the screen, uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 5 and 12 through 15 with the, um, the scripture of Matthew added in so you can hear God's commentary on this. And what he's saying in the parable is so through the use of numbers if you know how to use the subject algorithm as well as what number of meanings that are brought out in matthew chapter 13 verse 23 so let's read the strong one god through his messenger sows the seed to the word of god to bring folks into his household and separate those who willingly will not enter why to move folks toward returning to unity with god but those on the pathway of the road move in unity to the devil's creative works which snatches away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved those on the rocky soil behold and receive a revelation about god's grace and judgment are those who when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no firm root and believe for a little while and in time of temptation testing and trials they fall away they're drawn away as to revolt and the seed the word of God which fell amongst the thorns, the seed, the word of God that fell amongst the thorns, these are the ones who have heard as though as they go on their way, attaching themselves to worries consisting of riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Thus they choke the word, kill it, strangle it, reject it, and abuse it, and use it for appeasing their, their worries to gain riches and gain the pleasures of this life. Verse 15. But the seed on the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word, okay, that grows in a well-plowed, honest, good heart, and holds fast to the word, and bears fruit with perseverance to maturity, wholeness, and soundness. So let's add in Matthew 13, verse 23. The ones on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man or woman who hears, understands, and bears fruit, are those whose life reveals who they belong to, evidenced by their leaning, relying on the good shepherd who moves and guides and protects the heart and controls us by leading the sheep with his staff, all sealed by his blood covenant that fastens us to the only true shepherd of our soul. That is God's commentary. You hear the word of God, you're drawn. The word of God, when it's given, separates those who are in his house from those who are not. That is why the seed in the word of God is given, folks. And on the good soil, what's going to happen? You're going to bear fruit, and your whole life is going to reveal who you belong to, evidenced by you relying on the good shepherd in all things. How simple is that? I love God's commentary on this stuff. It really is, it adds a dimension to it that is just astounding, folks, just astounding. That's what I say. It's just outstanding there. So, folks, as you can see, this does not take away from the Bible at all. Instead, it only provides what I call a commentary in the layers of meaning in the text. No different than any commentaries written by men. But this one is more like a divine fingerprint from the true author of, of, of the Bible, God himself, on this matter. So, let us conclude with this, like I said, as I mentioned in the beginning, about people who see triple numbers in overabundance or quadruple numbers, and they're driving you bonkers. If that's you, stay tuned, because I'm going to address this right now. 
With this, I'm going to ask folks, are you seeing repeating numbers like 111, 222, 333, 444, 555, 1111, or 1212, so forth, etc., etc.? Have you thought that God is trying to tell you something or some sort of angelic host is trying to give you some sort of secret message? I want to tell you something. The answer is no, <laughs> like I said before. For example, in Chaldean numerology, the meaning of 111 means a spirit guide is trying to contact you. I'm just giving you a rough summation of it. In some form to enlighten you, to un unite you, to serve it endlessly for blessings. In other words, you see 111, you're going to be constantly going to have to do the superstition in order to get the blessing. Every time you see that number, you're going to have to follow it. So it means that a spirit guide is trying to make connection to you, which is in the Chaldean numerology has number meanings too. And you find those out, and they're not trying to tell you something. They're hoodwinking winking you. They're trapping you into a life of superstition and slavery to follow after these stupid number meanings that they apply. And anyone who know, knows uh, the occult meaning of numbers, uh, uh, Chaldean numerology, pagan theory, and so forth, etc., are going to tell you, and they come out of this stuff, they'll tell you to stay away from it. I guarantee you, God is not trying to speak to you, nor are angels from heaven trying to speak to you. Whatever it is, it's trying to unite you to the fallen world. That's what's happening. Next, people will report seeing 1111. And in Chaldean numerology, this refers to the law of attraction. So, you see ministers out there who will apply the principle. If you see 1111, uh, you know, if you sow a seed, you'll get it back. Some type of law of attraction is at work. That should give you a buzzword. The occult has crept into the church. And stay away from it. This is all occult garbage, and God forbids this type of thing. With that, let's look at the meaning of these triple numbers from their biblically-based numeric meanings, and you'll see God is not trying to contact you with secret information for blessings. First, the, word, the number 111 means the fear of the Lord. That's its root meaning, the fear of the Lord. That's all it means. So maybe you, when you see this n number, you better fear God and stop this superstitious garbage. How's that? Also, tradition says says that uh, when you see three ones, it means a triple blessing. I want to tell you, I'm going to pop your bubble. It does not mean this. It does not mean triple blessing. That goes back to Chaldeans. That goes back to the occult world, creeping in, masquerading as something good. It comes to the Kabbalah. Stay away from the Kabbalah. Okay? It does not mean triple blessings. It means a fear of the Lord. Our chosen servants are servants of God who fear the Lord. That's what that means. So with that, did you know that the number 111 through 999 all have the same prime factor of 37? Which means a chosen servant, a bond servant, a helper, or mighty men of valor. David's top 37 men are all implied by the number 37. Do a word search on the number 37 in the Bible and that's what you'll find. So you have 3 times 37 equals 111. And so that's how you get the idea of the fear of the Lord. Uh, so it's a chosen servant of God that fears the Lord. That's the meaning of the word, a chosen servant who fears the Lord. And if, and if that's you and you're trying to think that there's some secret revelation given to you, you better stop seeking numbers. I'm going to tell you how to stop that thing because it's not God trying to give you a secret thing and how to get wealth, get blessed, be a success or any nonsense like that. You're seeing that number, an entity is trying to trick you, hoodwink you to follow the devil. So what does number 222 mean in biblical number meanings? It means the son, the daughter of a harlot. It also means married to another to become their chosen servant. In other words, you become the chosen servant of the harlot. The harlot of the book of Revelations is what it's referring to. You become the son or the daughter of the whore of Babylon. That's the idea of that number. So if you're seeing 222, um, guarantee you that's not a blessing number, is it? So what happens if you're seeing number 333? Well, 333 three, three means a sign from God, the hurricane wind of God's Holy Spirit and might and power. And you go, oh, wow, God's trying to tell me. He's giving me a sign from God. Absolutely not. You have to have the Bible to interpret it. It just means the hurricane force wind of the Holy Spirit coming down like on the day of Pentecost. And, and, and filling the place. It's a sign from God that he is moving, okay? It has nothing to do with him giving you a secret message, okay? And since the prime factor 37 is in it, 
It's a sign from God to his chosen servants to give you the wind of the Holy Spirit in you, to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of the idea and some of the nuanced definitions of the actual word 333. So it doesn't mean what you think God's given you a sign. It means that he gives his chosen servants the wind of the Holy Spirit. That's basically a uh, the, uh, good way to look at that word without giving you all about five different nuances of meaning in the time I have. Number 444 means wealth. Oh boy, people get excited. I'm seeing 444. Oh, that means that wealth is either given by the son of a, or daughter of a harlot or that God has blessed you to be his servant. That's the idea. It has nothing to do with any secret message, nor is God trying to tell you anything other than that. So if you're seeing these numbers, maybe the devil and his minions are tempting you to become the, like I said, part of the harlot system. And, and that is, in fact, what's happening in many churches today. They sing these numbers, and they get all like hot and bothered by it. Oh, God's telling you a secret. Oh, man. God's going to pour out a blessing of wealth on you. Oh. Well, somebody who studied this stuff, I'm telling you, that's not the case. You cannot at all interpret Bible numbers without finding them in the Bible, applying the correct context and continuity in the scriptures to unlock the correct meaning. You can't do it outside the Bible by seeing numbers on a clock or a truck go by or a license plate with these numbers on it all the time. Something else is trying to hoodwink you. You better pay attention to this. The important rule for Bible numbers is this. Numbers can only be translated in the context of the Bible they are found with in accordance to the rules of Hebrew grammar to pinpoint the correct nuanced meaning. There's no other way to do this. Thus, seeing these types of numbers by themselves are used in the occult world and fallen watchers is how they make contact with human agents to capture them and destroy their life by superstitions and never-ending rituals and laws and formulas that they have to follow in order to receive blessings. It's a continual tormenting thing. Just telling you, that's what's happening. I spoke with people who were involved in the New Age movement who actually, through astral projected, made contact with these entities and through these numbers and used Chaldean numerology. They, they will give you their take on it in their own words, but the similar thing. Fallen entities are trying to make contact with you when you see these numbers. They are not from God. God doesn't do that. He doesn't need to do that to get your attention at all. So what about the quadruple numbers like 11, 11, and 12, 12? What do they mean in Bible numbers? Um, the number 1111 means fellowship of believers is few and far between, and their work show it. The prime factor of 1111 is 11 times 101. In fact, 1111, 12, 12, 14, 14, so forth, etc., all have the prime factor of 101. And, and 101 means rebels cast out. So the idea here is the fellowship of believers is far and few between that's one of the meanings and definitions but the prime factor definitions rebels are cast out for using the mystery of darkness the occult workings and make the fellowship of believers far and few between in other words the occult world um, uses the mystery of darkness to draw and break the fellowship of believers Maybe God is trying to use the occult world here, and if you understand what I'm trying to say here, to wake you up that you're being hoodwinked. That if you see 1111, uh, he's warning that you may be cast out for using the mystery of darkness and using the occult workings. So you better get back right with God, fall on your face and repent. And ask him, the good shepherd, to help you break the pattern of seeing these numbers and being driven crazy by them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, folks, chasing after these numbers indeed will draw you away from fellowship with God and his people and also draw you away from the word of God to rely on the superstition of numeric meaning. If you're seeing the number 1212, what does it mean? Well, the prime factor meaning added in here is, is 4 times 3 times 101, okay? It means uh, one's path is united to a strong rebellion. And next is the, the, I call the traditional uh, theme meaning. It means high priests, religious leaders who say to Pharaoh or their lords and kings, for silver I give you gold to move all into strong rebellion. That's the idea there. In other words, it's the religious world 
and priests and leaders in, in, in the religious world of the church or politicians, anybody who is, 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 is making a covenant with a lord or a king, so they'll give them silver. They give, you know, the, for silver, I give you gold in order to move you into strong rebellion. In other words, they're making a deal here to move people into stronger rebellion. So what does it all mean if you're seeing repeating numbers like these all the time, all throughout the day, and you're driven frantic saying, oh, I'm seeing these numbers. What do I do? Okay, let me tell you what to do. First, I got to let you know something is trying to contact you, which is not good. It is an evil spirit who will make you perform and perform for more and more blessings. And all these blessings are going to disappear in short order. Then you become a slave to superstitions and distracted away from Jesus and the Bible, which is not good. So what can you do about it? That's what people ask me. I want to be free of seeing these numbers. So this is what a person who told me, who saw these numbers, after much prayer, and we prayed together for a long time, and they finally, they, the Lord revealed to them what to do. So I'm going to share what they did to break this pattern. It's based on a scriptural principle, and I'll share, share that in a second. So this is what this person told me who kept, kept seeing these numbers. Yes, their family had a history of occult workings in their past. Okay. So a lot of times you see numbers, you have some family line or some connection somewhere you may not even be aware of that had a connection to occult workings and it kind of follows through the family tree okay so yeah you can pray and break that but the person was still seeing numbers so this is what they said to me how they broke it so I'm telling you so you can apply it to your life and what happened was the numbers stopped and the pool and the influence and the drive being driven crazy by seeing these numbers just ended and now every time they see it, they practice what they practice what they preach. And what's that? This person said to do this. You use the book of Psalms and Proverbs. Every time you see 111, go to Psalms 11.1 1 and read it and the verses around it out loud. Or you can go and read Proverbs 111 and then verses 8 through 19 out loud. Or Proverbs 11.11 or Proverbs 11. 11 and you'll see that number and you go around those verses and read those out loud as soon as you see those numbers just go to the bible and read it out loud even though it has nothing to do with those numbers or nothing this is what the person told me and i and i heard some other folks say this is very effective after a little struggle every time they see these numbers they started reading that and they had these, these verses memorized so they could say it in their mind as soon as they saw it and all of a sudden guess what happened they kept doing this immediately after they saw the numbers. And after a bit of time passes, the allure and drive to these numbers lessened and they go away. So now they see the numbers, they didn't even pay attention to them. Duh. Recall Jesus countered the devil during times of temptation by quoting the word of God. And the same principle applies here. How simple is that? So with that, I'll see you next time on the Christian Marauder. Again, my contact information will be seen as we roll out the video to the end. 